quotations. Okay, um, hello everybody and thanks for your invitation to talk today. I'm going to be drawing on work that I and colleagues at Democracy University in Leicester have been involved in since the late 1990s on the role of health consumer and patient organisations in the UK health policy process and in particular their relationships with other um, healthcare stakeholders. In recent years, for example, there's been a move to formalise relationships between patient organisations and the pharmaceutical industry through codes of practice and transparency agreements. This has been pushed by government bodies, industries and patient organisations themselves as an attempt to manage concerns relating to the legitimacy, representation and independence of patient groups should they accept industry funding. But how do transparency policies work in practice and what are the wider implications for groups developing relations with industry? And these are the two key issues I wish to briefly explore today. I would say that I'm drawing on data from the UK, which has a specific context governing the development, development promotion, funding and availability of medicines. But I hope some of the points I make relating to transparency and independence will have resonance in other healthcare settings. Health consumer and patient organisations, or patient organisations for short, are defined as voluntary sector organisations which seek to promote and, rep and or represent the interests of patients, users, carers and the wider public in the health policy arena. Patient organisations are seen as a relatively new and less powerful interest group in this health arena and they represent the often unheard views of patients and carers to those who have responsibility in managing and delivering care. In our studies in the UK, we concentrated on those working at national level and identified three different types of organisation. First, there are those groups based on particular conditions such as HIV, AIDS, breast cancer or multiple sclerosis, for example, that represented the majority of organisations identified. Second, we identified population-based groups which were focused on specific population characteristics such as ethnicity or age or, age, or on all patients across all conditions. And these groups tend to look up more generic, broad-ranging patient care issues. And third, we identified formal alliance organisations or umbrella groups, which bring together groups with a particular condition or illness area or across all health conditions. And these groups often adopt a specific policy focus on behalf of member organisations who lack the capacity to work alone. And patient organisations concentrate or tend to concentrate on three key tasks. First, providing members and the public with support and information about particular medical conditions or how they interact with health services. Second, ensuring organisational survival through fundraising and network building. And finally, representing their members' interests in the policy process. In effect, groups play a critical role in holding up a mirror to services provided. This slide um, shows how you groups view um, the importance of campaigning or lobbying on various issues following a um, survey that we did in 2010. And it showed us that 80 over 80% of groups told us their main campaigning priority was access to care and treatment, which obviously has clear implications for a potential shared agenda with industry. In addition, public health issues are becoming more important to groups, with a third of groups saying that their interest in public health had actually grown in the previous three years. And again, this probably provides opportunities for working with industry, as industry focuses more on expanding what Ben Goldacre terms the diagnostic limits of disease and promotes the prescription of preventative medicines if agendas are likely to merge. So it's clear that, that groups may seek relationships with industry or become receptive to industry overtures, and there are various reasons for this. First, groups are concerned with ensuring the public can access effective treatments. And this may be new drugs which offer fewer side effects, better survival rates or new hope in conditions where no treatment has previously been available. And much of the news items on patient group websites are actually concerned with reporting advances in treatment and may also be one way they attract members. And therefore having links with industry which provide them with this information will be useful to them. But they then face a dilemma on whether to name particular drugs or manufacturers and many will categorically state they don't promote particular brands. However, when the concerns about access to new drugs, patient groups are actually willing to campaign for this. And I would note that I've never come across a case where a 
groups in industry in the UK have actually worked together to campaign for access to a particular drug. But there are plenty of instances where groups in industry have concurrently pursued similar agendas. And there are some interesting issues around that. Attracting funding is also an issue for groups. And while many draw on membership subscriptions and some can apply for grants to government or funding bodies such as the National Lottery, they have, do have little recourse to other sources of income. And therefore, it's perhaps unsurprising that groups will offer opportunities for partnering with commercial interests, including industry. And groups did tell us that they see sponsorship as a way of providing services they wouldn't ordinarily be able to achieve, such as the publication of patient leaflets or the provision of web websites. And finally, groups told us that, you know, that they do recognise for their members therapeutic drugs will offer relief from symptoms, and therefore they see in relationships with industry as an important and necessary part of their role. And therefore, they seek, they seek these relationships because they wish to develop a mutual understanding. And there are examples, for example, of groups lobbying, particularly in HIV, AIDS, breast cancer and rare disease, to persuade industry to um, pursue particular research agendas. Um, and we also came across examples of groups participating in awareness events at company headquarters, so those working on disease areas could gain more, and more understanding of what it's like to live with particular conditions. But the question does remain, however, when money enters the relationship, how do groups manage and attempt to maintain their independence? Well, some groups simply refuse to work, but accept funding from industry. So the statement from Mind is a good example of where they say that by not accepting industry funding provides integrity and independence in the policy process. Other groups, such as Diabetes UK, argue that independence can be maintained through ethical and transparency policies and will link to formal codes of practice which set out the parameters of what funding they will accept and how the process of working with industry will be managed. And in addition, a number of groups also state the percentage of, total amount of percentage of funding they're willing to accept from industry and will often say that this has to come from multiple partners. Whereas other organisations merely note that they accept industry funding and state or claim on websites that their independence hasn't been compromised in any way. And finally, there are those groups who simply don't know how relationships are developed or managed. In 2005, the Trade Association for the British Pharmaceutical Industry, the ABPI, stated that all members must publish a list of patient organisations that they fund on their website or in their annual reports. And in 2013, um, a review of the ABPI members' website showed that 41 companies had provided funding to 161 patient organisations during 2011 and 2012. A cross-check of the patient organisations website showed that only 65% acknowledged they received industry support. So the ones that we knew accepted funding, only 65% of them actually gave this information on their websites. And in addition to this, only a tiny minority of these gave full information about this funding, including which company it was, the amount they received, the purpose and percentage of income from industry. And I just, th this lack of openness simply gives rise to concerns about independence of groups and the agenda of industry. And only 28% of groups stated that they actually had a policy covering their relationships with the industry, the pharmaceutical and medical devices industry on their website. And I'm not suggesting that those groups who don't give these links to policies don't have them, but again, their lack of openness is a concern. I'd also say, actually, this is actually an improvement. A study that I did in 2008 actually found only 26% of patient organisations um, known to receive industry support were acknowledging that they received funding on their website. So the message on disclosure seems to be getting through. But is disclosure enough? Are there other issues we need to consider when looking at industry group relationships? First, I think we need to consider what we mean by transparency. Despite industry and patient groups' codes of practice, there seems to be so many interpretations of trans transparency on, you know, in, on, in terms of looking at patient organisation websites and industry websites that, in a sense, this notion of transparency has almost become meaningless. Some companies and groups provide basic information, such as the amount of money that they've given groups or the amount of money they've received from industry. Others give more detailed information, such as the purpose of the funding and the percentage of income that this actually covers. And in addition, it should be noted that the data that I've presented here 
actually isn't based on a cross-check, the systematic cross-check of each grant listed by industry on group websites, because many patient organisations simply just list the, group, the, the pet pharmaceutical companies they have links with without giving any more detailed information. And I think to be effective, transparency must be defined and best practice in disclosure should be followed. This isn't likely to stop speculation of the intent of both parties, and nor should it for reasons that I'm going to come on to, but it will provide a more objective perspective than can currently be obtained. Second is money from the pharmaceutical industry different to other corporate donations. Many patient groups' websites use the term corporate sponsors and partners rather than the pharmaceutical industry on their websites. Again, it's possible to take a cynical attitude and suggest groups are attempting to hide their links. But another interpretation is that groups believe sponsorship from industry is just another form of commercial partnership. And while many would argue there's actually little difference between accepting sponsorship, for example, from Barclays Bank or Carlsberg than from G GSK or Pfizer, as they're all powerful multinational in, um, corporations pursuing their own agendas. As someone with an interest in health policy, I would argue that the pharmaceutical industry is different and should be acknowledged by patient organisations as such. Industry decisions in terms of therapeutic research agendas and pricing can have a significant impact on the healthcare sector. It was also interesting to note that on a small number of websites, patient organisations justified their, their relationships with commercial partners in industry by stating they didn't accept government funding, as if one source as in getting money from government is a conflict of interest and the other getting money from industry and commercial partners isn't. Accepting money from um, more powerful actors um, in the policy process, be they a policy maker or a private interest, can lead to accusations of co-option and raise questions of legitimacy from other policy actors. When patient organisations come to campaign for new treatments and policymakers note they accept funding from industry, it becomes much easier to dismiss their claims. Groups must be aware of this and, if at all possible, have strategies in place to counteract these concerns. Finally, some would also suggest issues around transparency and openness are actually a red herring. And what is more important is whether financial or in-kind relationships are actually in the interest of patients themselves, particularly in their role as funders of the health service. While there's an overlap of interest around access to um, treatments, relationships with pharma may lead to groups, to, to, to groups taking a critical view of their activities or an uncritical stance on the role of pharmaceuticals in society. For example, there are concerns in the UK that patients' organisations focus too much on holding government to account for refusing access to medicines based on cost-effectiveness, rather than addressing broader issues relating to access, such as the pricing and efficacy of new drugs um, compared to existing treatments um, delivered by pharmaceutical companies. So I think that what I would, would conclude by saying is that open and transparency is important, but it's actually how patient organisations hold pharma to account and challenge some of its, its other practices that's the true measure of independence within the kind of patient group pharmaceutical industry relationship. Thanks very much. Thank you. We don't have very long uh, for questions, I'm afraid.